This has been uh, a, a true science and statistical look at the uh, absolute absurdity of spending uh, public dollars on uh, total guesstimates, really, that have nothing to do with, uh, with real science. And we'll give you uh, a chance in a little while to question Scott and uh, Keston. Uh, we're going to uh, uh, change course uh, a little bit uh, now with Terry Dunleavy's uh, comments. Uh, Terry also comes to climate uh, science uh, from a, uh, a, a different direction, just as Scott and Keston did not uh, start off, and as Scott uh, said, is still not uh, really knowledgeable in climate science specifically. They come from other areas of, uh, of science, economics, and, and mathematics to uh, see the, the fallacy of what's going on in climate science. Uh, Terry Dunleavy is an expert on wine and vineyards, uh, certainly not uh, involved initially in climate. Uh, so talented and experienced in this field in New Zealand that he is just uh, short of uh, knighthood in the British Empire. Uh, Queen Elizabeth in 1990 uh, didn't knight him, but he did, did. she did make him a member of the British Empire, and he carries the initials MBE by his name, so maybe this next step will be uh, knighthood. If he, he's, he's 80, he's still got a few decades uh, left to make it, but working in New Zealand in the wine industry some years ago, he was told that global warming was going to reorient uh, the locations of wineries in uh, New Zealand as the uh, the temperatures of that uh, location were are going to change, and uh, that did not make sense to him, and he got, uh, he threw himself into uh, climate science and realized uh, the absurdity of these uh, predictions uh, on how the wine industry was going to uh, change there, and he really became an uh, advocate to uh, stop global warming alarmism, and he became uh, part of a new organization called the Climate uh, International Climate Science Coalition, where he is now uh, Executive Vice President. Uh, Tom Harris, who asked one of the last questions in the breakfast uh, session, is the Executive Secretary uh, with offices in uh, Canada. And you heard Joe uh, last night talk about the possibility of uh, carrying that organization forward to uh, create a new uh, professional uh, society that was spoken of uh, last evening. So with that, I introduce to you Terry Dunley. Yes, well, thank you, uh, Jay, for that uh, slightly flattering uh, introduction. Good morning, fellow rebels. Um, it's great to be here in New York. Um, I was just thinking a couple of days ago that uh, New York is home to two expressions of uh, humankind's finest aspirations, and I went to have a look at one of them, the Statue of Liberty, and we should never ever remember the, the gift of liberty and freedom of speech and all of those things that America has given to the world, and as a New Zealander, I just want to say thank you to America for that. Uh, the other uh, monument to uh, finest aspirations is down on First Avenue. I think uh, it's a place called United Nations. I think it's still a work in progress, uh, particularly uh, when it addresses matters of climate. So here we are in the, in the Big Apple, the core of the Big Apple, with a mission to save the planet. And what are we saving it from? Well, a uh, question asked by Pref uh, President Klaus last night. Well, we're saving it from being swamped by a tsunami of false propaganda about catastrophe caused by we humans uh, emitting a little too much of a colourless, odourless gas, carbon dioxide, CO2. The zealots who preach this propaganda condemn CO2 as a, quote, global warming pollutant because they claim that a consensus of world scientists has said this is true, and it must be true because they've said it under the auspices of the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, in its fourth assessment report for AR, published in 2007. But is it true? Do 
will climate scientists really agree that our emissions of CO2 are causing a global warming crisis? Read the papers, watch the TV news bulletins, listen to the politicians, and indeed former politicians. Carbon, short, shorthand for carbon dioxide, the gas we breathe out and plants breathe in, has become a dirty word and the source of a mysterious footprint. So, it must be true if so many of these people say it is. Humanity is causing it, uh, and all serious scientists agree. The claimed evidence, 2,500 scientists from the UN's IPCC, uh, joint statements from science bodies, many individual scientists. Yeah. Um, even your, the chair of your US Senate Committee on Environment and Public Works says, 2,500 scientists from around the globe participated in the development of the report which found that ruling of the planet is unequivocal and there is a 90% certainty that most of the warming is due to human activity. And the word they commonly use is consensus. It's got to be right, there's consensus. And not just any consensus, but a consensus of scientists. Now hang on a minute. Consensus and science? Consensus and science? Consensus is not, is not science. Consensus is certainly the lifeblood of politics, but it ain't science. As these two distinguished scientists remind us, Dr. Timothy Ball from Canada, scientific integrity is not determined by a show of hands. And an earlier and probably greater scientist, a man called Einstein, many experiments may prove me right, but it only takes one to prove me wrong. And when he said that, can't you just imagine the great doctor being applauded in the heavens, applauded in the heavens by Copernicus and Galileo? So let's take a closer look at this IPCC, and here let me acknowledge my friend and fellow coalition member John McLean of Melbourne, Australia, for a truly outstanding feat of analysis of IPCC's 4AR, made possible for the first time by the fact that IP, IPCC was required to make public not just the names of the people who wrote the report, but also what the expert reviewers had to say and what happened to their review comments. So what did John find? IPCC is not a meaningful indicator of world scientific opinion on the causes of or the future of climate change. Most climate scientists are outside of the IPCC, and a number of them are here at this conference. The, quote, 2,500 scientists, unquote, who supposedly reviewed and endorsed overall IPCC conclusions includes many who did not. And anyway, 2,500 is misleading. So just how many were involved in 4AR? Well, let's look at the, first of all, we need to look at the structure of IPCC. And here we see it has three working groups, WG1, WG2, and WG3. Uh, working group one assesses the available scientific information on climate change, its causes and its future forecasts. Two assesses impacts of climate change, and working group three formulates response strategies. So, there was a total of 850 plus contributing authors, 400 plus lead authors, and 2,500 plus scientific expert reviewers. Um, actually, there is a total of 2,890 individual contributors since some authors are also reviewers and the IPCC lists authors or reviewers more than once uh, when they deal with more than one working group. That reference is from uh, John McLean. That's, um, that's still a lot of people. So 
How many of them are actually climate scientists? That's hard to say because many of the disciplines related to climate and, the, and, and also because of the consequent difficulty in defining a, what is a climate scientists. But here's one estimate. Uh, concerning these 2,890 individual contributors, Dr. William Schlesinger, an IPCC lead author and former dean of the Nicholas School of the Environment at Duke University, said that he thought, quote, something on the order of 20% have had some dealing with, with climate. So let's look at all this a little more closely. The uh, working group one is clearly the, the driver, and we see that it has the around 600 expert scientific reviewers. We are led to believe that these hundreds of independent expert reviewers studied the drafts of the report and provided extensive feedback to the editing teams who then incorporated their comments into the reports. Oops. Isn't this true? No, that is an illusion. The, uh, what uh, my friend John McLean found was that only 308 of the official IPCC expert reviewers commented on the final draft before the report was taken over by governments. Contrary to the IPCC implications, about 600 reviewers of every word of the WG1 report, only five, five, commented on all 11 chapters. Continuing the breakdown, only 62 reviewers, eight of whom are designated as government of somewhere or other, uh, a number of countries, uh, gave any comments at all on the crucial chapter nine. 55 of those 62 had serious vested interests they were authors or editors of the report or papers referenced to support it, or worked for establishments that likely received government funding for projects focused on a, on a human influence on climate. And you know, there's something we should never forget, that right from the get-go, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change was set up to look at human-induced climate change. No, there was no, no natural causes were uh, eliminated. So, oh, now, um, so of, of the, have I jumped one there? Of the remaining seven, uh, yes, yeah, so we've got 55, uh, 62 down to 55, of the remaining seven ind independent reviewers who commented on, cha on chapter nine, Five made just one single comment on the entire chapter, and only one explicitly endorsed the most significant statement of the chapter, and then only with a brief generalized expression of support for the complete 11 chapter report. So, so how did the IPCC's editors react to comments by reviewers, not always kindly according to John McLean's analysis. They often rejected uh, reviewers' comments, a reversal of the normal practice in scientific peer review. Many were rejected with little or no justification for doing so. Peer reviewers had to justify amendments put forward, but the responding editors were under no obligation at all to justify their rejections uh, of reviewers, pro reviewers' proposals. I commend to you the um, entire document uh, produced by John McLean, his analysis of the IPC endorsers. It's, uh, you can... Uh, uh, that's the title of it, and hopefully we can give you the uh, yes. And you can you can uh, download it from. I don't know how we missed that, uh, Tom. Uh, well, if anybody wants to know the the URL, see me afterwards. But it's uh, 
McLean, you know, see me out because it's too long to, to uh, sing out. Hmm? Oh, it's on the hand out at the back, thank you. Yeah, there is a hand out at the back, thanks to Tom Harris, and, and all that information will be in there. So, um, there were in this, uh, just before I, ju I jumped there a bit quickly, in this document there were two passages that grabbed me. On page 14, John d describes the reactions to a reviewer who made 572 comments, the majority of which appeared to strike at four contentious issues. The corruption of the generic meaning of climate change into man-made climate change. That's, that's important. When they talk about climate change, they're talking about man-made climate change. When we talk about it, we're including, uh, incl we're including natural forces as well. The matter on, of whether urban heat islands are dis distorting the temperature record, and Anthony Watts has done some magnificent work uh, on, on that issue. The discrepancy between tropospheric and surface temperatures and the impact of El Nino events on any trend. The IPCC editing team rejected these four points claiming there was no distortion in the meaning of climate change. Um, yeah. Uh, it argued that there was no evidence that human induced outputs of heat have corrupted the data for this claim um, and relied on the, a paper that investigated the effect of wind on urban, urban nighttime temperatures but lacked critical details like wind speed direction, time of lowest temperature change of wind speed over time, etc. It referred to papers that disputed the tropospheric temperature record but ignored the lack of independent audit of the accuracy of near surface temperature records. They claimed that El Nino events are internal to the climate system and ignore the warming of the sea surface caused by solar radiation. And here's the second passage that grabbed me. In summarising the key points of his paper, John described how scientific research is largely funded according to its relevance to government policy. Governments are attempting to determine scientific truths by starving some research avenues of funds but providing other avenues with an abundance of money. And I think we heard a bit about that last night from, uh, from Dick Lindzen uh, about the difficulty of young scientists in getting uh, funding unless they um, comply with uh, the support for man-made global warming. The involvement of governments in the IPCC process pretty much guarantees that funding for climate research will be directed to projects that align with the IPCC's claims. This research will of course, of course produce more papers on these subjects and the IPCC will subsequently cite these papers as greater evidence of a human influence on climate, there's that consensus thing again, which in turn will drive even more government funding into IPCC compliant areas. In the long term, this perpetual and increasing marginalising of contrary viewpoints is extremely detrimental to the science because it will produce a supposed scientific truth, in quotes, based on little more than the emphasis of the funding and the nomination of certain opinions. And now we come, these opinions are supported by people like Dr. Vincent Gray, who explains, all the IPCC does is to make projections and estimates. No climate model has ever been properly tested and their projections are nothing more than the opinions of exports, experts with a conflict of interest because they are paid to produce the models. There is no actual scientific evidence for all of these projections and estimates. And Dr. Yure Israel, you can see him up there, there is no proven link between human activity and global warming. But the real, almost inexplicable flaw in the whole IPCC assessment report pr process is the summary for policymakers. The summary for policymakers. Supposedly an executive summary of science reports and generally the only documents read by media politicians and uh, activists. So let's look into this SPM. 
The problems with the SPM are, one, it selectively reports on the science, two, only 51 people, they call themselves scientists and we're not sure about whether they all are, worked on a draft version. There were 33 drafting authors and 18 draft contributing authors. And here they are. You want to know who they are? There, there, there are the, the names of the people, and I recognised uh, two from New Zealand. Uh, both, uh, one is employed by a university funded by the government, the other is employed by the government, uh, and they are, of course, uh, vigorously towing the IPCC and global warming line. You'll probably recognise one or two names among that lot. It's also to important to appreciate that the final SPM, assembled in Paris, France, if memory serves me correctly, is written at a plenary session primarily of government bureaucrats and representatives of environmental and industrial organisations. Not surprisingly, it selectively reports on the science, cherry-picking points to suit the alarmist agenda um, and Dick Lindsay was here before, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure he's here now, but his comment on the SPM was that it represents a consensus of government representatives, many of whom are also their nation's Kyoto representatives rather than of scientists. But finally, here are the most grievous problems. The vast majority of scientists who rate the main science report did not see the summary for policymakers before the public did. It was published before these guys from whom the information was derived were able to see it. Many IPC scientists who contributed to the main report openly disagree with the, the summary for policymakers and the, the SPM was published three months before the science report. With this proviso, changes to the main science reports made after acceptance by the working group or the panel shall be those necessary to ensure consistency with the summary for policymakers. And if you didn't get that, let me repeat it again. The summary for policymakers comes out, and then the people who wrote the main report are told that they cannot make any changes to their, their main report unless the, the changes they make uh, ensure consistency with the summary for policymakers. Talk about putting the cart before the horse. Uh, so again, Professor Lindzen's, Lindzen's conclusion, the SPM, which is seen as endorsing Kyoto, is commonly presented as the consensus of thousands of the world's foremost climate scientists. In fact, it is no such thing. The SPM has a strong tendency to disguise uncertainty and conjures up some scary scenarios for which there is no evidence. Now. Yeah, well, you can, you can read that while I catch up with my notes. So, the conclusion uh, of, uh, that comes from, oh yeah, sorry, I, I must have pressed this too hard. Fortunately, as well as the, um, as well as the IPCC report, we had the independent um, report produced by uh, Professor Ross McKittrick uh, and uh, some friends who studied the same data, uh, 10 people, they studied the same data and they came to the conclusion that the IPCC scientists <coughs> are highly uncertain about future climate change or the impacts of climate, uh, of human CO2 emissions. And you can download that at, um, at the URL that is seen there. Very quickly now. Um, if those who want to talk numbers should have a look at some of these contrary opinions which have appeared just in the last uh, 
three years or two or three years. Um, and th then we've got the Oregon uh, petition, which uh, Art Robinson, no doubt, will be talking about l later in the conference. And there are the numbers of the people who uh, signed, and you can see from the back background, most of them uh, had relevant uh, qualifications and knew what they were talking about. And uh, uh, for those who know science, I in the science world, I gather, I'm not a scientist, but I gather that, that uh, Freeman Dyson is uh, somewhere in the, the nature of, a, of an uncanonized saint, uh, and he is typical of the people who signed that uh, petition. So uh, I hope that I have been able to convince you that the IPCC uh, 4AR uh, is not worth the <laughs> large paper, uh, pile of paper that it was written on. Thank you very much. Thank you, Terry.